Happy Fourth of July weekend, everybody. So glad you joined us instead of hanging out on the boat today. Which you can do later. You can do that at the boat later, so that's good. So, all right. Everybody's moving in. Well, welcome to Good Soil Church. I'm Dave. I know I've met, I think, any of the new people I've already met, but uh, welcome to our home where we do church right now. And uh, uh, we just love the environment that is created here when everyone walks in this room. We get to worship. We start with worship every week. And, and then we hear from God's Word. And so today's an exciting day. Uh, it's We're going to talk uh, in a minute about David and Goliath. And so we're, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of intro that in a minute. But I want to let you know, like, there's a lot of scripture today um, because... Uh, this is a big, great story that God tells it better than I can tell it. But, uh, but I want to prepare you for that. But first, I wanted to intro why we're doing what we're doing and what this day, today, the day before July 4th, is kind of all about in this country. So um, when you walk into this house uh, and, and you worship on a Sunday, um, our goal is to create a life-giving environment. What that means for us is that when you feel, when you come into this place, you feel free. You feel like something's taken off of you, not put on you. And uh, that's our goal every week when we set that up. And, and we, one of our family verses is 1 Corinthians 3.17. It says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord, there is freedom. And so wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there should be freedom in that place. And so our goal is that this house and this church is a place where you can find freedom. Um, but correlating with that, uh, 246 years ago, on July 4th, uh, there were some men who decided that the people in this country needed some freedom. So, I'm going to talk about that for just a second. I don't know if you guys know much about the history of this country. I, I love American history. I, I think we're very special as a country. And um, over the thousands of years of recorded history, and the thousands of empires and different governments set up, uh, the average lifespan of any entity, any government entity, is 17 years. 17 years, like on a single document. Now, there have been empires who've tra changed over hands that have been longer than that empire, but, but a single governance, 17 years. And tomorrow, we celebrate 246 years under the same piece of paper. The Declaration of Independence and then the Constitution. So, we're the longest-running constitutional republic in history, and it's just a blessing to be a part of it. And I hope you guys all feel um, like you're blessed to be a part of it. The first Continental Congress was... Uh, First met on September 5th, 1774, actually. And so these guys got together, and uh, there were 13 colonies. And so I have to point out the fact that uh, the colonies did not like each other. There was no unity in the colonies. Everyone was different. They didn't even know each other. So the guy from, you know, uh, Georgia did not know the guy from New York. Like, they just, they didn't know each other. And so these guys all come together, everyone except for Georgia. Georgia didn't come to the first meeting on September 5th. And uh, so this painting is actually, the, it's called the uh, John Trumbell Declaration of Independence. So this is this, a picture of the signing of the Declaration. 56 men are in this picture. They're all named, and actually, so you know every single person and who they are. And uh, they came to a meeting before this. This is the signing. We'll talk about this in a second. But on September 5th, 1774, these 12 states came together, and uh, they started. John Adams wrote back to his wife and said, we started in two hours of prayer. And we studied in depth four books of the Bible. That's what he's writing to his wife. And it was amazing to see these men of God come together and be unified that something has to happen. That was the first meeting of the Continental Congress. It was a Bible study and a prayer session. And so John Adams uh, told his wife, man, we studied Psalm 35 and it was incredible. And so he quoted Psalm 35 to his wife. And I just... Imagine these 12 states. Now, Georgia got in there, so Georgia was fine. We're fine. We'll, we'll include Georgia from now on. So 13 states got together, and they studied the Bible. And uh, Psalm 35, 1 through 3, says this. And think about how this feels when you're about to wage war against the largest empire in the world. Contend, Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take up shield and armor. Arise and come to my aid. Brandish spear and javelin against those who pursue me. Say to me... I am your salvation. Psalm 35, 1 through 3. These guys were saying, we're going to war. And we need God at our side. We need God behind us. And less than two years later, 56 men would sign the Declaration of Independence. And John Adams, on July 5th, the day after, um, wrote his wife again. And there's actually, these letters are, are known and they, they, they're, they're in someone's possession. And he wrote this. 
I am apt to believe that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as a great anniversary festival. It ought to be commemorated as the day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty, John Adams. John Adams thought the 4th of July would be a religious holiday. And until the early 1900s, Christmas and July 4th were considered religious holidays. The two biggest religious holidays in America. So, the first act of Congress after that day was to call for a nationwide fast. All three million people in America need to fast and pray because something's going to happen. So, on July 4th, 1826, 50 years later, July 4th, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams both died on July 4th. And there's one person left who signed the Declaration. So, so John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, um, uh, Sherman, this is John Hancock, who was the president of the Congress. And right back here, this guy right here, um, this guy is uh, Charles Carroll. He's actually, his official title is Charles Carroll of Carrollton. Um, short day Charles Carroll. So he is the last remaining signer of the Declaration. And uh, the city of New York says, hey, we have an original Declaration in our city hall. Would you write on it? Would you write a note on the Declaration? Can you imagine that? Just, you know, like, we think we can't even touch it now, right? But they asked uh, Charles Carroll to write how he felt about the country 50 years later, like reflecting on what they did in this room. Um, and he, he wrote this. I am grateful to the Almighty God for blessings which, through Jesus Christ our Lord, he has conferred on my beloved country. He said, I can't thank God enough for what he has done for America through his son, Jesus Christ. These men were Christians. These men set up a country where you could practice whatever religion you wanted because they based their values on Judeo-Christian values. So, tomorrow when you're shooting off fireworks and barbecuing and uh, celebrating the freedom that we all do have, <clears throat> remember that these 56 men who signed that in that picture um, were committing treason, high treason. Benjamin Franklin is actually known to, be, to say as they walked out, if we don't hang together, we will all hang together. <laughs> like saying, if these 13 colonies do not stay together, like we're all going to die. And so the largest empire in the world is coming to our shores in the next couple months to wage war. And so uh, just remember what they did. Most of these, 10 of these men did not see the end of the Revolutionary War. Uh, some of these men, um, their wives were arrested, thrown in prison. Like, it was a big deal what happened. And uh, so when we celebrate the freedoms that we do have, almost 250 years later, um, just know that we're a blessed nation. We fought tyranny with freedom. And because of the blessing of Jesus, we were able to do it. So... All I have to say, I love America, and I think we all should, and we should work to make it better. We should always try to improve, but we need to come back to some biblical values in our country. We have been working, though, through the past couple months in a series called Bible Stories because we're all Bible illiterate. I mean, today, compared to what John Adams could quote, um, he could quote the Bible in Greek and Hebrew, and, uh, and they knew the Bible. We don't know the Bible as a people anymore, and I came to Christ at 21, did not know the Bible at all. So... So this kind of study we're doing called Bible Stories is taking these big stories that we all heard of and we're breaking them down and kind of giving you the truth behind them all. So, um, God has an ultimate redemption plan and each story in the Bible is building to one big story. And that's what we talk about. Whether it's God's miraculous life-saving power with the Israelites and the desert and the Exodus or just prophecy about the coming Messiah of Jesus. There's over 700 prophecies about Jesus that he fulfilled impossible to do unless it was true, um, or simply to just show the mercy and justice of God. And that's kind of a theme that we see throughout the Bible. Each story is a small story, and it's part of a larger story. So we started with creation, and then last week we talked about Jericho and the walls of Jericho falling, and, and Joshua doing that, and, and how Joshua then had this lifelong campaign in the promised land, taking over areas of the promised land. He never had a moment of just relaxation. You know, Solomon later gets to just relax and enjoy the fruit of what Joshua and what we're going to talk about today, David, did. But uh, Joshua worked hard his whole life. And we saw that in that story, God uses um, unlikely heroes to do miraculous things so that he gets all the glory. So he searches the whole world for people who are going to honor him, love him, and be available to him. And so he used Joshua as a warrior, but he also used Rahab, the prostitute, the down-and-out lady, to save the Israelites 
And then to use her in the lineage of Jesus, and we hear about her in the book of Matthew, and how God took a prostitute and included her into this divine genealogy. I just love every bit of that story. God can use anybody. And so today, we're sticking with that same war theme, though. So we're going to talk about the most famous battle in history, I think, and that's uh, an unlike un unlikely battle, and a battle that you may not fully understand what happened, but it fascinates anyone who hears about it, and that's David and Goliath. So, I love the name David. Um, it, it, uh, it means beloved, just so you know, it doesn't mean warrior, it means beloved. And, uh, but this story is a story full of bravery and courage, but also faith. But the thing that people don't talk about, it's also a story about preparation and a God-appointed opportunity and then seizing that opportunity. So I'm excited to open your eyes to this story a little bit more. And, uh, and I hope you see that um, by no means was David ill-equipped for what he walked into. And that's the goal of today. So your Bible today is going to be 1 Samuel 17. The entire story is that one chapter. I'm going to fly through a lot of scripture. Get your kids, I know you like to write everything down. 1 Samuel 17, just later, write the whole chapter in your journals, it'll be perfect. But so as I fly through, don't be like, oh, you're going too fast, because i got to get through a lot of it. Because so, I want the story to flow, so you see like almost an anxiousness building you. Like, this, this story is crazy. This is a crazy story. So, let's get into the story. Ready? Here we go. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Soko in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes Damim between Soko and Azekah. I'll, I'll show you in a second. Saul, the Israelites, and Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Allah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with a valley in between them. 1 Samuel 17, 1 through 3. So let me set this up for you because it's really important. So, sorry, it's a little, a little blurry today. I don't know why it's a little blurry. So, uh, so this is the Dead Sea. If you remember, uh, Joshua was brought all the way around, crossed, um, uh, the Jordan right here, and then took the city of Jericho. If you notice, I did topography because there's mountains right there. So what happened was they had been conquering people over here on the east. Jerusalem's at the highest point in all of Israel. There's a reason for that, right? We talked about that before. And, um, and so Jerusalem's right here. Bethlehem's a little bit southwest of that. And then over here you have the plains of the Philistia, which means the Philistines. So the Philistines came from Greece, which is over here, and they occupied the plains and the coast. And the Israelites are over here, and they occupy the east. We're about to hit. So um, the, the Philistines, though, were a seafaring people, so almost like the um, Vikings. That's a good way to think about the Philistines. And they came, and they landed on the coast of Canaan, and uh, as they were conquering this way, Joshua was conquering this way, and... Um, so they moved east, Joshua moved west, and they hadn't yet taken Jerusalem. Joshua hadn't taken it, but they had occupied Bethlehem. So Jerusalem's kind of a mix of a bunch of different people groups. And um, you see that there was constant conflict between them. We actually read in the book of Judges that Samson killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. Like, they were constantly um, attacking each other and fighting each other. And it all kind of came to a head. So the Philistines, though, were an advanced people. A lot of people like draw them up as like this ogre, you know, because they had some giants, they thought of them as like, you know, backwards thinking or slow or, you know, like very um, uh, behind the times. They're actually the opposite. So they are Greek of origin. And so they actually were high thinkers and they actually had developed the smelting of iron. So they had weapons and they had large weapons and they... The uh, Israelites were a people that used the mountains and caves and like kind of guerrilla warfare. And the, uh, the Philistines just stood in line with their iron spears and just charged you, okay? So different. So they were highly intelligent. They had this smelting of iron and um, they were very advanced in the weaponry. So they're in the West, they're in the East, and about 1000 BC, this conflict. We're coming together. So that's where we're at. They all entered into a... Uh, an area right down here, I want to point this out. You see all these rivers. There's some rivers coming through here. And then there's mountains, okay? So the only way through, you cannot go over the mountains, is through the valleys, where the rivers are. And there's five ways to get through. The one we're going to focus on today is the Valley of Allah. And um, they entered into this place called the Shepala, which is the like kind of rolling hills as you're about to enter into the mountainous areas. And there's five valleys going to Jerusalem that can reach there. 
and the law is right here um, in kind of the south area of Canaan. So, it actually exists. So this is a Google map. So imagine this is west, this is north, south, east. Right. Okay. So you're coming in, rolling hills, rolling hills, rolling hills. You see this river cuts through a mountain. I'm going to show you a different angle in a second. This is the Valley of Allah. Okay. Imagine the Israelites are posted up here, kind of northeast, and then they occupy this hill, which is the strategic hill. The, um, the Philistines come in from the west, and they occupy this hill. The southern hill, less um, less strategic, and they're looking at each other. These two armies, hill to hill, with a valley in between. So Saul, the appointed king, went out with his army to meet the Philistines. So he's doing what he's supposed to do. Okay, so he he leaves uh, his hometown, comes over, brings his uh, soldiers. They're camped here, and every single day they walk to the mountain, and they're standing there in battle formation, battle lines, battle lines. So there's a stalemate. No one wants to enter the valley. So the Israelites are in the northeast, the Philistines in the south, there's a river running between, and you're at a stalemate. And they're sitting here. And then we hear about Goliath. So it's 1 Samuel 17, 4 through 7. Oh, let me go through these. Okay, that's perfect. So, so this is the north, actually, so flip your mind the way it was. So this is where the Israelites were, valley in between. The Philistines are over here occupying this hill. And you're looking down at this valley which has been untouched, so yeah, they've planted some things, but there's no development there. There's just a single road that runs through it. You can still go here, and it was fun to kind of do the research on all that. And then, um, <clears throat> this is another picture. So this, we'll talk about this in just a second. This is actually a compound that David built later on the hill that they were on when all of this went down. And you can imagine the Philistines lined up here, the Israelites lined up here, in the valley, and there's a creek. See all these trees going here? That's the creek. That's where David picked up his stones. So David would have walked down this hill to meet Goliath right there. All right. 1 Samuel 17, 4 through 7. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. He was height, his height was six cubits in a span, which is nine feet, nine inches tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze, weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves, um, and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, so huge, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels, so 15 pounds. Imagine a kettlebell, 15 pound kettlebell, on the tip of your spear, and he was able to just throw that thing. And he had a shield bearer who went ahead of him. So he actually had a little guy with a big shield in front of him. So you imagine this nine foot tall guy with a guy in front of him with a full body shield holding it in front of him, and that's, that's your competitor, right? So. It's an imposing sight, to say the least. So, um, and uh, 10 through 11 says this. Then the Philistines said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. The army of the Lord was terrified. They knew they were outmatched. And for 40 days, the Philistine came forward every morning and every evening and took his stand. So you have this giant of a man, a champion of the Philistines, armed with bronze armor, wielded an iron spear and a body shield, which I just think is hilarious. He's like, who is that guy who gets to stand in front of Goliath, right? So, and we know he's from Gath, which is west, it's on the coast, it's an excavated city, we know it was there. Uh, he was a giant, he was a distinguished warrior, but we also know he had family. He had four other giants that are named, that are his relatives. So there's corresponding text in the Bible, I'll go over one in a second. There's four other giants just like Goliath. So the Philistines descended from these ancient Greeks, and they thought you could just have these battle of champions, this one-on-one -on -one battle. And the reason they thought that was because they thought, thought the gods were fighting with or without you. So when he challenges him, when he challenges the army, he's like, your god versus my god. That's pretty much what he's saying. Um, so the, the, the giant standing there saying, whatever gods he was believing in are better than your god. And so uh, we see this in the Iliad, the Odyssey. There's like these, these gauntlets thrown down all the time, one verse one, for the, for the war. And so, you know, <clears throat> this could potentially save thousands of lives, right? You're thinking, okay, we'll pick your best warrior and go against it. It's better than losing thousands. But no one's brave enough, not even the king. And I want to point out that Goliath was huge. They got overpowering. But the reigning king of Israel at the time, Saul, was no small man. We see in 1 Samuel 9, 2... That Kish, this guy, had a son named Saul. 
as handsome as a young man could be, found anywhere in Israel, and he was a head taller than anyone else. So he's probably high sixes, low sevens feet tall. So Saul was not a small guy. He was actually the perfect guy to fight Goliath. Um, he was truly the person who should have stepped up. God had equipped him with size and stature. He positioned him to be a protector of the people. He had named him king. And, and uh, the reason he didn't was his, his heart was already corrupt. Uh, he didn't have the faith to step into this challenge. And I wrote it this way because this is a lot of pressure. The gauntlet's thrown down. I wrote it this way. The pressures of this life will expose our true character. Saul was exposed in this moment. He had been living this life of a king, and he actually marched all his guys down there. I think he was hoping something else would happen. And in the moment of decision, he, he failed. So, what do you do when the pressures of life come at you? Are you a Saul? Or are you going to be what we see as a David? Because the king we saw was a coward. Uh, God had equipped him to do this. Actually, I think Saul, of all the characters in the Bible, had so many opportunities to turn back to God. And, and he was the first king of Israel, and God really could have used him in a, a mighty way, but he, he, uh, he walked away from God. But David, we will see, had the character of a king even when he has not yet come into that position. When we meet David, we learn he's the youngest of eight sons of Jesse, a sheep herder in Bethlehem, and his three oldest brothers now have gone off to fight with Saul. So it's him couple brothers, he's out sheep herding, and uh, one day, um, in the same story, 1 Samuel 17, it says this, Now Jesse said to his son David, Take this ephah of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. So run to the battle lines. Take along these ten cheeses to the commander of their unit. So bribe the commander, give him, give him some good graces, and see how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. So early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd, loaded up, and set out as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out for its battle positions, shouting the war cry. 1 Samuel 17 through 20. I want to point out that David served his father without complaint. Even though it appears that he was the least in the family, he took every role that was given to him seriously, and he honored his dad in this request. He said that early the next morning, like the first time he could go, he went. So David leaves Bethlehem. If you remember from the picture, it's about 15 miles. doesn't mean David was in Bethlehem when he heard his father say that. They were kind of sheep herders, so he could have been a little closer. But David moved quickly. Before dawn, these guys are moving out to battle lines and gets there. And you can imagine a boy of about 15. So everybody's like, David's about 15 years old when this is all happening. Arriving into that valley, just the excitement of the fights happening. you got this one army on this hill, uh, hill over here, one army on this hill, and this 15-year-old boy is just walking into that. And um, every boy, I think, dreams of that, like dreams of that moment. Like John Eldridge, who wrote Wild at Heart, this is an amazing men's book, he writes that every man wants a battle to fight, a beauty to rescue, and an adventure to live. And this is the battle to fight. Like David gets to just walk into this as a 15-year-old. It's just how God made us, made us as men. We want to fight for something. And so here we go. First Samuel 17, I just love this. David left his things with the keeper of supplies. So remember, I said they're camped at one spot of that picture, but they went up to the hill, to the battle lines every time. So David gets to the camp first. He's like, where's everybody? Oh, they're up at the battle lines. He's like, keep the stuff, right? So like, he leaves the supplies, and he runs to the battle, which I think you'll see as a theme. Runs to the battle lines and asks his brothers how they are. So he, he finds his brothers, hey, how you guys doing? And as he's talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from the lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. So imagine, Goliath walks down that hill every day to the middle of that field and screams out and curses their God. And whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. So David did not know about Goliath before this moment. He was out of his tent in his sheep. His dad calls him in, says, hey, go talk to your siblings, give me an update, take them these supplies. This is his first glimpse of the giant. His brothers were at war and likely didn't communicate very much with the family, so he didn't even know the situation. Like, there's a stalemate here, what's going on? So he was walking into this situation blind, which I think is super important to know. He had not prepared for this moment. Um, he had not planned on stepping into that moment. But when he heard Goliath curse the Israelites and his God, it did something in him. So here we go. Next line from David uh, in, in 1 Samuel 17, 26. David asked the men standing near him, 
What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Imagine a 15 year old boy, a bunch of guys behind him, like all armored up. He's like, what? what's this guy doing? This guy is cursing our God. What's going to happen to the person who kills this guy? Not knowing that no one had offered to do it, right? And so he, he's like, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? He's like, this guy thinks he's going to take us with God behind us? Like, he's so confident. That this army is going to kill this whole thing, not knowing that these guys have been cowards for 40 days. So David is mad. Uh, he has a righteous anger just well up inside of him because this man's cursing his God. So Goliath's words struck a chord with David, and it moved him in his spirit in a way that he could not ignore it. So what are you passionate about? What strikes a chord with you? Because God is probably equipping you to make a difference in the area of the thing that is your passion. So if you hear about foster kids and adoption, it's just like, we've got to fix that. You know, like, that's how God equipped you. If, uh, if you see, you know, people who are down and out and you just need to help them, that's how God equipped you. If you see any situation and you, like, feel like this, like, fire inside of you, that's God-ordained. Like, God gave that to you. And what God did for David, he made him a worshiper, he made him a warrior. And uh, when he heard someone cursing his God, who he worships, and he's like, this guy, because he's already a warrior, um, you'll see what he does next. So I wrote it this way, though. God gives us a passion for the things he wants to see us change. God is not going to do everything in this world. He's equipping you to do a lot of things in this world. So we can't do everything, though. We can't do everything. But God has set us up to make a difference in something. So there's something that God has equipped you to do. So a bunch of people with different passions pulled together into a strong community, which is what this is, end up changing the world. So different passions. I'm not going to be the same thing as everyone else is passionate about. I'm not, that's not, not how God works. He's going to bring a bunch of people together, so then together we change the world in different areas. Um, so David's rage is obvious, and he's asking questions. So he's asking questions like, what's going to happen to the guy who kills this guy? Like, who's going to step up? What are we doing? And then all of a sudden we see in 1 Samuel 17, 28, something change. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, so this is the oldest guy, he's been there for a while, Heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him. So instead of being angry at Goliath, he's, he's angry at his brother. And he asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave the few sheep in the wilderness? So he's like even insulting how many sheep David gets to take care of. Like, think about that. Just, I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down here only to watch the battle. I mean, that... Like, it literally hits every part of your character, like, in a terrible way. Um, so he's reprimanded by his older brother immediately. So, why? Like, what happened? Well, I have to remind you about the, the first story we read about his brothers. It's in 1 Samuel 16. I'll, I'll quote it in a minute. But uh, we read about the anointing of David. Well, Eliab is the oldest of eight. He was the first one into the room to meet Samuel. And he's the first one rejected by Samuel and God. And then he had to watch his little brother get anointed with oil and uh, be kind of named king of Israel. So the first thing, so he's been, you know, this has been in him for a long time. First thing he does on the battlefield is question David's motive. Eliab is living with jealousy of his brother since the beginning, and it shows in his questions about his motive. So we see that uh, David was coming just to serve his brother. He was literally coming with food, check on his brother, and he was just interested in what was going on. There was no ulterior motive there. Um, Eliab's comments were inappropriate and unfounded. There's no reason for them. But we see that David had learned over time to trust God and ignore the haters, which is a word for somebody today. Um, <laughs> David ignores him because David, uh, God had taught David who to fight and who to leave alone. <clears throat> who's worth your time and who's not. And I think that's uh, for somebody today. Every fight is not yours to fight. This is some fights you just need to walk away from. And you'll see what David does in a second. But who in your life is your Ilya? Who is that person who just uh, just tears down your character? They always got something to say, and you just there's no life in that. There's no like life giving moment. It, there's no redemption in it. Like Ilya, there's no redemption. We never hear about Ilya like turning the corner and be like, "Oh, Dave, you're awesome now." You know that never happens. So there's an Ilya in your life, and you probably need to like just delete contact or whatever that means. Okay. So, um, but why are you giving them a voice in your life? That's the question. Because you'll see what David does in a second. He shuts it down. He turns and focuses on his God. Because I promise you, God has a lot to say about you 
and for you that's going to build you up, build your character, and set you up to make a difference. And if he had listened to Eliab, he would have thought um, totally differently about himself. So he knows who he is because he listens to who God says he is. And that's a lesson for somebody today. God has a name for you. He has a story for you. He has a, something that you um, need to know about yourself, and you can only find it from God. So from his time with God in the fields, so he spent a lot of quiet time with God, he developed an incredible confidence on who he was and who he was going to be. And we'll listen to his response to Eliab. In 1 Samuel 17, 29 through 31. Now what have I done, said David? Can't I even speak? He then turned away to someone else. Like He's like, stop it. And he just turned. Like, and so uh, he turns away to someone else and brought up the same matter. And the men answered him as before. So they told him, the person who kills that Goliath is going to be a rich man. He's going to marry Saul's daughter. And he never pays taxes again. So David's like, all right. I mean, I was just going to do this for free, but okay. And so, so David um, said, uh, what David said was overheard. So David's like sitting there going, okay, so someone's going to kill him. Can I, can I do it? Can I do it? And um, this was reported to Saul, the king of Israel. And Saul sent for David. So he ignored his brother and clarified what the full situation was. So he took some you know, inventory of what's going on. And um, he was acting like a professional. Like, it's like a professional guy, like asking... 15-year-old kid who comes in like, hey, what's the story of this? Who's going to handle this? What do they get paid? They get paid to do this? Like, why, why are you guys not doing this? Like, he's asking, like, sophisticated questions for a 15-year-old. I think we undersell what a 15-year-old can do nowadays. And uh, it's been 40 days of taunting and day and night by this Philistine. And finally, someone's willing to step up. People notice when you stand out from the crowd. So are you the one at school or work who falls in line and cowers back? Or is your character positioning you to step up into difficult situations? So David, in 1 Samuel 17, 32, he's in front of the king of Israel. This guy is probably, you know, close to seven feet tall. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. So I want you to notice David's language here. Let no one lose heart. He was concerned about the morale of the soldiers growing weary. Remember, his town is the next town. This town is the closest town to this valley. These Philistines are moving through this valley. They're at a stalemate. The next town is his town. His family. His livelihood. Everything. So he's actually thinking about his family and all of this. He's like, wait, they're going this way? That's home. So uh, he's willing to step up. He didn't come that day to become a hero. He was just being obedient to his earthly father, delivering groceries. But once he arrived, David took responsibility that no one else would accept it was like any other day for David. He was just tending his sheep or running errands for his dad. And I promise you, he did not expect to be fighting Goliath. But God had been preparing him in the unseen places for this moment. So on this ordinary day, David was ready when challenged, when the challenge arrived, and it changed his life forever. And I wrote it this way. God will use your faithfulness on the ordinary days in extraordinary ways. So God was going to use David because David, on the normal days, was the same guy he would be in this day. So he stayed, uh, the word for you is to stay faithful in your ordinary tasks that God has called you to. Because David was a sheep herder and then a worshiper. Um, but God was shaping his character and building his courage, which we'll see in a second, and he was ready. I love 1 Peter 5 and 6. It says this, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. David didn't know when he was going to become king. He knew God told him he was going to become king. He waited a very long time to become king. And uh, humble yourself before God. God, shape me, because at some point, I know you're going to call me up into something um, in this life. If you do this, if you humble yourself and allow God to shape you, he will prepare you for what's next. And I wrote it this way. When your moment arrives, you will see that God has prepared you for exactly what he needs you to do. You're not going to do everything. But you need to do something, and you don't know what that is yet. I don't think any of us in this room actually know what, what's ahead of us, what God has ahead of us. David didn't. God can use David because David didn't need to be used, but was willing to be used by God. Are you available for God to use you today? Uh, will you be ready for what lies ahead? We'll talk at the end about how to prepare yourself for what God has for you. All right, so Saul is king of Israel. Look at this 15-year-old boy, sheep herder. Now, he's dressed like a sheep herder. Just everybody knows. He's in no armor. He's just sitting there with a staff, like, had a basket. He dropped the basket. He's not just a staff. Right? So Saul replied in 1733, 
You are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man. And he has been a warrior from his youth. So his brother Eliab and the king Saul were both looking at David. The outward appearance and tried to discredit David's abilities. But this isn't the first time David has heard that he wasn't enough. So remember back to the story of Samuel coming to that house and the house of Jesse and anointing the new king. The choice was obvious. It was Eliab. Taller than the other brothers, the, the oldest of eight. Um, but this is what happened in uh, Samuel, 1 Samuel 16, in verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. That's Eliab. And he pretty much said that to all the other brothers. And he's like, hey, do you have any other sons? And they bring David in. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Even Samuel, the prophet of God, chose Eliab. He, it's like, oh, it's got to be him. And, um, and uh, he was looking at the outside. He first picked the oldest brother as the potential king, and it was rejected. So, Eliab got rejected. And instead, God chose David, who was the least likely, and he got anointed in front of his family. And that's where we see this jealousy and this like uh, hatred for David develop amongst the family. I think his dad was probably proud, but, uh, but the brothers probably hated him. And I wrote it this way. The Lord looks at what is on... Oh, the, the world looks at what's on the outside, but God looks at the heart. So how's your heart? Like, what's going on in there? Like, is your heart the, the heart of a, a worshiper like David? Is your heart a heart that can receive uh, criticism from God or critique from God? Are, are you able to be changed? God knew what he was doing in picking David. He knew that David would be open to being developed into what he needed him to be in the future. I mean, this was years later. You know, David was anointed like around 13 years old. So two to three years later, David's here facing this um, obstacle. And then God spent the next couple of years after anointing David, developing his character as well as his skills. So David then describes to Saul how God has done everything in his life to this moment, to this specific moment. So 1 Samuel 17, 34 and 35 says this, But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. Okay, great. When a lion or bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. Then this is my favorite line in the whole chapter. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. So he didn't just like, hey, lion, give me that back. He like tackled the lion and like killed the lion, right? He's telling the king of Israel this. And then um, in 36 and 37 it says, your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. So this king is looking at this 15-year-old boy who's telling this story about killing lions and bears with his bare hands in the wilderness. He's like, you're good. All right. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, you can do that. So um, David was a bad dude. Like, he was full of confidence. Uh, he was a humble guy, but when it came to this fight, he had... No humility about him. Uh, he looked at the king of Israel, the general of this large army, as he watched grown soldiers cower in fear, and he said, I got this. And so this is amazing. Just amazing. Think about that. On top of that hill, they're sitting there. Everyone's cowering. He's speaking to the king. He's like, I'm going to go down there right now and handle this for you. So most pastors right now would um, either wrap it up, that's a cool story, or start talking about the faith of David. Like, the faith of David, the underdog, this underdog story, you know, taking down the giant. You can relate that to your life in so many ways. Maybe you're the underdog, God's got something for you, that kind of thing. Um, how you can do anything if you just have the faith to do it. And I agree, the faith is super important. And I'll never, um, David had the faith that he could do this, right? Um, and, that, uh, and that God can use unlikely, unprepared people to do incredible things, but I don't think that's the lesson from today's story. So, a little spin for you. Um, I think David was ready for this day. Um, I think he was prepared. He had allowed God to shape him in the ordinary life that he was leading, and because of that, Goliath didn't stand a chance. So, he was sent to the fields to shepherd his father's flock, and it was there in the wilderness where he learned about God's nature. He worshipped God. He heard from God. And through the trials that God allowed him to walk through. God did not stop the lion from coming. God did not stop the bear from coming. He allowed those things to happen. 
And the whole time God was with David. But it said David seized the lion with his bare hands. It did not say God struck the lion with leprosy. Right? That didn't happen, right? Like David killed the lion and killed the bear. Um, and you see, David had faith in God, but his faith, faith was that God would never leave his side. Not that God would kill Goliath. His faith was that God had equipped him for this moment. It was going to be in some human power to do this. He was confident in who God made him to be, so when his moment came, there was no hesitation. So David, this teenage shepherd from a tiny town of Bethlehem, standing in front of the king, speaks with confidence of a seasoned warrior. Saul gives him his blessing because he's a coward. Because he's like, finally someone's going to step up after 40 days. Think about that. 40 days, no one had taken this on. And he watches this boy walk into the fight that he should have been fighting. So, we read later in all these stories how Saul's very jealous of David and tries to kill David. Well, David was just honoring God. He was not trying to discredit Saul in any way. He's like, but no one's doing this 40 days? I'm going to go. So, in 1 Samuel 17, 40, this is what we read. So, then he took his staff. Oh, by the way, Saul tried to give him all this armor. I didn't talk about this part too much, but David's like, I'm good. I've been out there with the lions and bears without armor. I'm good. That's never been tested on me. Let's, let's go. So, he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the, the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. 1 Samuel 1740. So, going back to this picture. So, David's here talking to Saul. Um, Goliath's down here screaming. Your God is terrible. An army of Philistines on the other side. And David tells Saul I'm going. Walks down the trail. There's actually a trail that they believe David walked down because it hits the stream first. The stream comes here. He goes to the stream, picks up five stones in this uh, brook of Elah, and then goes out to meet Goliath. So he's moving towards the fight with his giant warrior with a staff, a sling, and a couple stones. So, I made this yesterday. This is David's sling. So it's not a slingshot. So, uh, oh, those are cool. I'm not a huge prop person, but you could, you could not do this. So, so uh, the way the sling works, so it would slip in his pocket, and it's just two strings with a piece of leather, and you wrap it in one hand, and so you put your stone in here, you pinch it, you pull this out, I'm not going to do it, I promise. I did it yesterday. And, uh, and you just, you swing and throw. And, uh, and you release this, and it releases the rock. Okay, so, really neat, right? So, David has this in his pocket and a staff. So, this is also where pastors will tell you, God took that stone, and the Holy Spirit just moved that stone perfectly, and struck, um, uh, struck the line right in the head. And so, um, I do not think that's a correct interpretation. So, David was a slinger. There were three army regiments back in the day, and there was infantry, hand-to-hand -hand combat, um, and then there were the assassins, which were the slingers. And so, there were, there were guys who had arrows at the top of the hill, and then there were slingers. They couldn't be in the line that the arrow guys were, because they had to swing it, right? But, um, but we have some Roman military texts <laughs> from about this time that tell us that professional slingers could hit a small target, the size of a skull, from 200 yards. And the projectile could be hurled more than a quarter mile. Like, the, the longest stone sling that we have in our recorded history is 1,400 feet. Um, that's a long way. So I took this, and I've never thrown one before, and yesterday I threw it into those woods. I'm like, oh, house over there! Uh, I didn't think I would get close. And it was pretty incredible to see that. So, um... Sling bullets, so like the rock or the, um, the Romans used lead bullets, um, could be launched at 100 miles per hour. And this is the correlation. They've done these tests now. It's as deadly as a 44 Magnum to the head. So David has spent his youth in the field slinging stones. Just pretty bored, right? Just like all day. Pow, 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 pow. And um, he was killing lions, killing bears, preparing for a battle he never could have imagined. He's just having fun as a boy, training himself up, you know, because those bears and those lions were coming. But David was an assassin. He was perfectly positioned to take down an impossible enemy. So maybe I should say it this way. Goliath brought a spear to a gunfight, and David knew it when he walked up. He was like, oh, got this, done this. So, but why five stones? We heard the story, right? He put five stones from that brook in his pocket. Well... Um, it wasn't a confidence thing. David did not think, oh, miss, miss, got him on the third one, right? That's not how David thought. Goliath had brothers. He had four of them. 
2 Samuel 21, 19-22, you can read this. It talks about how David and his mighty men killed those brothers later. And there was one like cousin. They're not sure if the one was an uncle, but there were four giants. David knew there could well be a possibility that when he killed Goliath, confidently, that his four brothers might try to exact revenge and he needed four more stones. So David prepared himself. He picked up five stones, one for each of the brothers. David was not, like, not confident in this. So I'm going to read through these next verses pretty quickly. So you're not going to be able to write them down. But this is the story of what happened right now. As he's walking down this hill, he grabs those five stones. And here we go. And I hope your heart races while you hear this. Ready? <laughs> Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bare in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome. And he despised him. So this starts, Samuel uh, 17, 41, and we'll go through 51. So here we go. He said to David, am I a dog that you come in with me with sticks? So he had a staff, right? And he had, the sling was probably down to his side. So it looked like a stick, 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 right? So you come with me with sticks. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give you, I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David said to the Philistine, You've come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Fifteen-year-old boy to a giant. Just keep on, just, this very day I give, you, I give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals. He's not just going to kill Goliath. He's like, I'm, this whole thing's going to be done today. And the whole world will know that there's a God in Israel. That's the point. <clears throat> All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet him. You just love that. Just you can imagine that one guy coming off the hill, glass there, like, what are you doing? What am I, a dog? You know, look at this little boy. And David just charges him. And he's like, oh, oh, he's coming. Okay. <laughs> and he's not going that way. So David ran quickly to the battle line to meet him, reaching into his bag. And I want to show you this because I actually tried to do this. So if this is already on your wrist or hand, or whatever, you actually can pull out, put it in, and start swinging immediately. So it's like a one motion kind of thing. So it was smooth, and he would have been good at this. So um, David ran quickly to the battle line of him, reaching into his bag and taking out a stone. He slung it and struck the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. Yeah, I know. It's intense. <laughs> David ran over and stood over him. He took a hold of the Philistine's sword, because remember, he didn't have a sword, and drew it from his sheath. After he killed him with the stone, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. 1 Samuel 17, 51. How awesome is that? <laughs> the Israelite army then pursued the Philistine army and killed them all the way back to Gath. They were all dead on the roads. Because they saw this young boy and the confidence he had and what he had just done on that battlefield. The battle had been won because of the strength of one boy who had been equipped in the wilderness and then had the... the confidence to step up when he was supposed to. All right, here we go. Ready? I love this part. As soon as David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner, who's the general in charge of the army, took him and brought him before Saul, with David still holding the Philistine's head. <laughs> <laughs> this, this boy, just like a shepherd out, he's bloody, just like, this like Philistine head in his hand, right? And, uh, and then Saul says this, whose son are you? Young man, Saul asked him. David said, I am the son of your servant, Jesse of Bethlehem. What, an, what amazing character for a little boy. Bloody, dirty, soon to be hero of a nation, anointed king of Israel. And when he asks who he is, he replies with humility and honors his family's name. He doesn't say, This is who I am, this is how God made me. I'm like, nope, honored his father's name. And this was huge in this culture. Uh, you see, David was different. The army was fighting out of fear and obligation. So when it came to facing their fears, they didn't even step up in the moment. They needed a leader to believe in something bigger and them to follow, right? So that's the army. So the army couldn't do it. Saul was fighting for power his whole life. Just, I need the power, I need the power. And he fought to keep power. 
So when he saw someone more powerful, Goliath, he became powerless. He didn't trust God for what he needed to do. His true character showed when he faced the troubles. David was fighting for honor and for his God. So what he was fighting was bigger than himself. He didn't matter. His God mattered. Sometimes we need to get over ourselves and start fighting for something bigger than ourselves. David's motivation was to glorify God. I just want to end on this verse. It says in 1 Samuel 17, 46, I jumped over it like when I read through it. But The whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. Why am I killing you? Why am I coming down here? Why am I going to do this? So that everyone knows that God is in Israel. The one true God. So David knew what the battle of champions meant. He knew his God would succeed because there is no other God. Because of this, God allowed David to be used to glorify his name, and he did. David is a very flawed man later in life, but David's heart in these moments was like true and uh, focused on God. David walked into this fight knowing the fight was already over. Isn't that amazing? It's like a, kind of like the Super Bowl. If you like know the ending, you're kind of like the whole time, you're like, oh, we're good. <laughs> I know. I know it's kind of, that's how David felt. Then. Like, he's like, no, we got this. And uh, not because of anything he had done, though, but because of how God, what God had done in him, and he knew that God was going to use him in big ways. He's like, I couldn't die. I'm the anointed king of Israel. I haven't become that yet. God already made me a promise. So this is just another obstacle in the way. This is just another lion or another bear. Uh, so I, I don't know how it's going to happen. I know I'm a good slinger. God's going to like, win this for me. And so David had gotten along with God, spent time with God, and allowed God to shape his character, and then allowed himself to be used by God for a greater purpose. We're not all going to be David. We're not all going to kill a giant and then be a celebrity, right? Like that's, celebrity to me is like the worst idea ever, you know, for all, all people, right? But, but that's not the point of the message. The message was not that he became famous in that moment. He did. And David actually stayed in the army. And David killed tens of thousands. There's actually songs about it that really made Saul mad, right? So, so David killed tens of thousands. He became a warrior. In this moment, he wasn't quite a warrior yet. He was a boy who knew how to sling a stone really hard, but he had the confidence that God gave him to step up in the moment. So... Um, I want you to see the story of David can teach us something about the, the story of David can teach us something about God and God's character. See, our God is a personal God. He created you on purpose and for a purpose. And um, but He's the only one who can reveal why, why you were created, and and what He has ahead for you. See, David showed us that God does not look at what the world looks like. So I don't know what words have been spoken over you, but today I'd say, in Jesus' name, those words are off of you, because God has a different name for you, something different for you. And um, God sees your heart, He sees your potential, He sees how He made you in your mother's womb, He saw, man, that's, that's what Tucker's going to be one day, when I can shape his heart and change him. Um, because God made him for a purpose. We don't know what that purpose is yet, but God does. And so uh, God wants to shape and mold you and take what he has already put in you. He doesn't need to add anything to you. He needs to shape your heart that's already there and allow it to be used for the glory of God and to grow his kingdom. And that's our goal of starting this church, is to grow God's kingdom, be obedient to what he called us to do as a family, and to grow his kingdom. Like, this has nothing to do with our names. And um, if we had to step aside and let someone else take it because it will grow God's kingdom more, that would be wonderful. Like, we'd love to do that. Um, he wants to do incredible things through you and your family, but first he needs to reach your heart. And that's what he did with David in the wilderness. That's what he did with David in the fields. He got, he got David's heart. So the first step is for you to actually receive the fact that God does love you and does want the best for you, and he just wants to connect with you. So today, as we close um, this amazing story, which we will come back to, I promise, but um, I would just love to pray over you that you understand that you were created for a reason. I don't know if you feel like hopeless today, if something's going wrong with the job or life or you know relationships, but like those don't matter to God right this moment. He, what matters to God is you and your heart. And so um, the God of the universe wants a personal relationship with you. I think David knew that and it changed him. And so um, the moment you turn back towards God though and step into that relationship with Him in a real, it's, it's a real and powerful thing, and it has to be real to you. Um, God begins to do a work on your heart, and over time, over time, that's the key, right? Uh, you're still going to have some hurdles in life. You're still going to have some things coming at you. You're still going to have lions and bears. But over time, um, everything he put in you, he's going to change, mold, shape, and then he'll be able to use it to change the world around you. And like I said earlier, when a bunch of people who are built differently, designed differently, and God has um, positioned differently, all come together, 
and do all those things we're supposed to be doing individually as a group, the world changes. This community changes, the city changes, everything changes. We need a lot of churches discipling a lot of people in that way and drawing them back to the heart of the Father. And so that's our goal for you. So uh, with that, I just love to pray for you. Uh, Father God, thank you so much for each and every person in this room. Like you said in your word, Lord God, you formed them. Their inmost parts in their mother's womb. You knew them before time. You knew who they were going to be. And you have a plan for each and every one of their lives, Lord God. But each of us have fallen, Lord God. Each of us have walked away from you. And, and uh, some of our hearts are, are so corrupt, Lord God, that we don't even know where to go. But right now, Lord God, we just pray that each and every person presses into your presence. That they turn back to you and say, God, you, you know my heart. You know how you formed it. You know that this heart of stone... It can be turned to a heart of flesh, Lord God. So right now, we just pray for each and every person that they receive everything you have for them today. That they take time, Lord God, to get alone with you and hear from you, to read your word and, and hear its truths over their lives, Lord God. <clears throat> we just pray that every single person will, will start praying to you and, and have conversation with you, Lord God, so that you can speak back to them, Lord God, and, and tell them who they are and how they were made. Lord God, we just pray for each and every person, the anointing that is on their life, for different areas of lives, Lord God, that you allow us to step into those challenges and make a difference for you and your kingdom and to glorify your name. Lord, we love you and we love what you're doing through Good Soil Church. We love what you're doing through each one of these individuals and their families, Lord God. We continue to pray that you bless each and every person as they step deeper into a relationship with you. We just pray that your Holy Spirit moves in powerful ways in this place, and that we continue to, to work towards a building your kingdom, Lord God, with everything we have. We pray that when we meet the giant, Lord God, when those walls are standing ahead of us, that we know that you've prepared us in the wilderness, you've prepared us in the quiet places to step into the challenge and do the things that only we can do. We love you, Lord. We pray this blessing over each and every person. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen.